This is Revolution at Sea with John Curtis Perry. Episode 10, Dutch Culture and Dutch Decline. We know the Dutch best through their art. If art is a record of beliefs rather than a literal record of social experience, how does Dutch art reflect Dutch beliefs? First might be lack of a strong religious impulse. The product of religious iconoclasm, Calvinism, forswore imagery in churches, but tolerated it in ordinary life. What artists made was not for princes, prelates, or aristocrats, but for ordinary people. Because the church no longer supported the arts, Dutch artists did not for the most part paint saints and miracles, nor the grandiose or the exotic. Artists chose the humdrum, the material, especially humanity in all its diversity, grossness, and pathos, pompous civic dignitaries, ordered towns, scrubbed interiors, bowls of lush, ripe fruit and vegetables, drunken parties, and group portraits, Rembrandt's Night Watch being the most famous. Artists even painted medical dissections. These were public events, perhaps 300 or 500 people would attend on winter evenings with scented candles and flute music. Painting becomes an industry, a commercial enterprise. The Dutch founded marine art. Ships, admirals, naval battles, and portraits of the sea in all its moods. Paintings in prints also were sold everywhere, even in butcher shops. Literally millions of canvases. People would line their walls vertically with paintings as if they wanted to nail down the world before it floats away. Paintings and prints for a time put the sea at the center of Dutch identity. Foreigners looked at the commercial society of the Dutch with mixed feelings. A British observer defined the UP as a counting house protected by a fleet. Others described the Dutch as meticulous, precise, calculating, all energy, bustle, liveliness. The Chinese spoke of the Dutch as covetous and cunning. Although the foreign stereotype would become the stout, placid, even phlegmatic burger, this was a society of hard living and hard struggle, embodying the high energy, even violence, of a new social order. To the foreign visitor, it offered novelties, fascinations, and delights in virtually every field of activity. Visitors constantly marveled at the prodigious extent of Dutch shipping and commerce the technical sophistication of industry and finance, the beauty, order, and cleanliness of the cities, the degree of religious and intellectual toleration, the excellence of hospitals and orphanages, the limited character of ecclesiastical power, the subordination of military to civilian authority. All noted the achievement of a great sense of comfort, a collective addiction to eating, smoking, and drinking. Diderot said the Dutch are living alembics, distilling in effect themselves. Some foreigners were appalled by the excessive freedom as they saw it. That feeling exists even today. Earlier, it was lack of proper social hierarchy. Dutch society seemed a seedbed of promiscuity of all kinds, subverting proper relationships between masters and servants, nobles and commoners, men and women, Christians and non-Christians, 
soldiers and civilians. And women, women were extraordinarily free for those times. Wives could walk beside their husbands and engage in business independently. A German visitor reported, here the hen crows and the rooster merely cackles. In general, outsiders liked parts of Dutch culture, but not the whole of it. Some were inspired by the military science, infantry tactics, artillery, fortifications, reflecting the Dutch need to defend a land frontier. And the maritime, too, such a conspicuous part of the Dutch world then and now. Peter the Great came from Russia, incognito, although everyone knew who this extremely tall foreigner was, who came to study Dutch marine technology for a time working in a shipyard. The comparative freedom attracted a remarkably large number of the greatest minds and cultural figures of Europe at the time, including the Frenchman Diderot, the encyclopedist. Thomas More wrote much of his utopia while in the Netherlands. Science and philosophy flourished in a non-absolutist political atmosphere. We can cite the humanist and social critic Erasmus and Grotius, Hugo de Groot, father of international law, the philosopher Spinoza of Portuguese-Jewish ancestry. Dutch scientists invented the telescope and microscope, discovered the rings of Saturn, and launched the wave theory of light. Dutch culture was a great concentration, a sustained creativity in a small space, accomplished by a society considerably smaller than its chief rivals. It presents an immensely rich and comprehensive tableau stretching from art and agriculture to finance, shipping, and technology built upon the necessity of generating profit, amassing assets, creating wealth. Decline was perhaps inevitable. The Frenchman Montesquieu noted in 1729 that in Amsterdam, people were withdrawing their money from commerce to put it into structures. I see that it will be as in Venice, beautiful palaces instead of fleets and kingdoms, he wrote. The Dutch could briefly be a great power because they could fill a short-lived regional power vacuum ended by the resurgence of larger nation-states. The Dutch lose some of their commercial advantages. Hamburg and London have greater hinterlands and develop competitive ports. International markets grow and goods move directly from producer to consumer. Originality yields to conservatism. Others change techniques of shipbuilding. The Dutch do not. Other nations have skills and capital. They build their own ships, smelt their own iron, sew their own canvas. We see the emigration of skilled workers, especially sailors, Many fewer men are willing to choose the maritime life. A contrast between rich and poor increases with a condition of private wealth and public poverty not unique in affluent societies, accompanied by increasing nostalgia for a golden past. The Dutch had a much smaller base than their British rivals, and they were hybrid unlike island Britain. Their land frontier made them highly vulnerable to attack and invasion, examples being Louis XIV, later Napoleon, and Hitler. Defeat, occupation, indemnities, and annexation by Napoleonic France in the early 19th century gave the coup de grace to the UP as a global power. The Dutch recaptured their independence 
but not their prominence. The Dutch were greater merchants than producers. Their industries did not nourish the machine. They lacked coal and iron, and their huge capital resources were constantly depleted by the needs of frontier defense. But agriculture continued to be excellent, and the Dutch make money by trading. Amsterdam until the 1750s was a pivot of world trade and finance, still a cash machine. The UP remained richer than England in proportion to its population and extent of territory. In 1776, the Netherlands was still by far the richest country in Europe with the largest share of the carrying trade. The Dutch were the first winners of the Oceanic Revolution, exploiters of its discoveries. They spawned an oceanic society able to embrace change at least throughout their golden century of the 1600s. This ability was rooted in diversity, tolerance, and social fluidity, a meritocracy richly flavored by entrepreneurial zeal. But Dutch toleration did not extend abroad to their empire. There we find cultural arrogance, an acceptance of slavery, apartheid in South Africa. They made remarkably little cultural impact in Indonesia, despite a long presence there, illustrated by language. By contrast, whereas many Indians now speak English, few Indonesians speak Dutch or would want to do so. The Dutch enjoy a late 19th century revival by tapping the wealth of Indonesia and with the rise of a unified Germany making a bigger economic hinterland. The discovery of diamonds in South Africa brings wealth to Amsterdam. One-third of its Jews engaged in the diamond business, cutting and polishing, buying and selling. Trade and finance continue to flourish today with heavy overseas investments in the U.S. and elsewhere. The Dutch built a great complex of money, goods, and information handled with precision, speed, and trust. Their society is still ahead on social issues, but challenged now by a 10% Muslim population, difficult to absorb into the mainstream. Today, people are asking, what is Dutch? Fearful of losing that sense of identification, traditionally so important in creating and sustaining the national culture. Yet, The oceanic experience, although less pervasive than in the past, continues to be critical to the economy and society and offers an inspiring example to others. Next, we'll move across the North Sea to England. There, the English learn much from the Dutch. England begins to perceive the sea, and increasingly, the maritime experience shapes the nation. So join us next time for episode 11, Early England and the Sea. Revolution at Sea is written and spoken by John Curtis Perry, with additional voicing by Jamie Rosenberg. Recording by 1623 Studios in Gloucester, Massachusetts. Production and distribution by Albert Buichadé-Ferré. Goodbye until next time.